And okay, we are live. So welcome to this uh, second Thursday New Farmer webinar series that we have. I guess this is our third month now of doing this. And tonight we're going to be talking about um, whether markets make a good marketing choice for farmers. And um, the answer is, as with most things, it depends. And so we're going to spend some time tonight going over a few issues that you might want to think about. We also have um, Tom Bivens on the line with us, who is the executive chef at NECI, and also, I think, the chair of the board for the Vermont Fresh Network. Is that right, Tom? That's correct, yeah. OK. So um, we will get a chance to hear. Um, marketing to restaurants is a really cool way to carve out a niche for your product and you couldn't ask for a better state, I think, uh, to feature your product in and Vermont has some of both some of the best growers and some of the best restaurants so I think it's a perfect match. Um, but it's not, a, it's not a perfect match for everybody and it's not an equally good choice for everybody. So tonight we're going to go over a few of the um, considerations that you really ought to be thinking about in order to decide. Um, whether selling to restaurants is a good idea and how much of your business you might want to um, parcel off to the two restaurants. So anytime you have questions, again, please go ahead and type them into the uh, chat box. That would be terrific. And we'll scoot along here so we have plenty of time to hear Tom and to hear questions as well. Uh, so why restaurants, for sure? Uh, well, for one thing, it, it helps to promote local options. And as you all know, the, uh, the whole buy local um, fever is, has really say, taken off in the state and nationally as well. But here in the Northeast, we're really leading the pack. And consumers are really wanting that personal connection. They're wanting to know who grows their food. They're wanting to patronize places that um, that, that are willing to support local growers. It also helps you greatly to grow your brand within the region. So even if you're not selling exclusively to restaurants, um, those consumers that come into that restaurant see your name on the menu, see your name on the table tent. They remember that when they go to the market or they go to the co-op and they're shopping. And if they see your brand again, they're going to remember that they had something that they really enjoyed at a restaurant that was yours. Um, it also offers growers an opportunity to experiment with some unusual varieties. Sometimes um, uh, consumers are a little slow to take risks regarding um, fruits and vegetables that are unfamiliar or meat products that are unfamiliar to them. Um, and chefs are very often sort of the trend leaders in the area of getting uh, folks comfortable with that. And it's a much safer option and environment for a consumer to try something new at a restaurant because then they're not committed to eating a whole season of it. Um, and they get a chance to try it when it's well prepared as opposed to um, trying it at home where they may mess it up and um, not enjoy it as much. It also offers an opportunity for experiment. Oh, it offers a relationship between people who love and appreciate food. I mean, I can't think of two people um, other than chefs and farmers who really have a, an intense personal relationship with the food that they work with every day. So um, for a lot of reasons, it makes sense to actually go ahead and um, think about partnering with restaurants. And I'm realizing now that I've put in lots of um, photos of food in the um, thing, so I hope you all had dinner <laughs> before you signed on. Um, so OK, I'm going to get ahead and go ahead and start on some of these questions now. And again, there will be um, some downloads that you can download off of the website. So um, you don't have to worry about taking notes or anything. And this session will be recorded. But the first question that you're going to have to ask yourself and be honest about is, do you have adequate production experience? <coughs> Excuse me. And there's a couple of reasons why you want to think about that. The first of which is that restaurants typically will look for high quality product, which means that growers with some production experience are usually going to be a bit more successful with this market than beginners who are more likely to have inconsistent results. Um, and chefs are also very often going to be looking for sort of those season extensions, so the early season, late season availability. And sometimes that requires some expertise on the part of the farmer. And the final thing is that chefs are going to want, again, these sort of unusual things. They may want heirloom things. And all of those are certainly very, very doable in Vermont and in the Northeast. But the problem is, is that sometimes it takes a little bit more production experience to get really consistent results over time with those kinds of things. Um, and Tom, I will invite you to 
to pipe in any time you have a, a comment or a question or more to add on that as well. Um, so the second one is, do you enjoy experimenting with new and unusual products? Uh, remember, restaurants survive a lot by keeping up with changing consumer taste. That means that they're always going to be looking for unusual varieties, for something new to try, for something um, a little bit different than what you would find at the supermarket, the co-op, the farmer's market. If you like to experiment with new and different products, chefs are likely to be a good fit for you. But again, it's going gonna, it's gonna to require a little bit of um, production savvy, um, and you're going to have to be willing to be a bit of a risk taker, because some of these things you're going to start off with are not commonly known and there may not be good production history and records in the state or in the region to sort of help you as you go along. And these, some of these things may be a bit more vulnerable to um, the vagaries of the weather. So if we have a particularly wet season like we did last year or a particularly dry season or um, a bug infestation or, or any other kind of calamity that strikes, um, some of those crops may be a bit more vulnerable. And I, and I would say that, you know, chefs are actually, uh, and restaurants are a great place for you to try out those things. Um, chefs are very adventurous, generally speaking, and want to, um, ha you know, have the latest, newest thing in their restaurant. And so I think if you have that kind of um, adventurous spirit, this is the best way for you to, one of the best ways for you to do that. And the other thing is chefs are really, um, we're sort of frustrated, um, gardeners and farmers ourselves, so you know, we're looking through uh, seed catalogs and we're trying to figure out what, what would be new and interesting to have in our restaurant as well. So um, through, through the use of, 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 um, of the resources that are out there for us. So I think it's a good opportunity for you to have a partner who wants to, to help you do grow new and interesting things. So. Right. So the next couple of questions for you to wrestle with when you're evaluating this as an option is, are you diversified enough um, and are you flexible enough? And the diversity really speaks to the fact that um, depending on where you're located, restaurants will tend to buy smaller quantities more often. and, and um, so basically it's in the farmer's best interest to have multiple products to, to um, be able to offer to help sort of fill up that delivery time and to make it worthwhile. So for example, if the only thing that you're raising is um, fingerling potatoes, um, it's probably not going to be worth your time in the long run to be making trips for just that one product. So you, you're going to want to have sort of a portfolio of products. And the flexibility piece, <coughs> Excuse me. Um, one one factor that impacts the farm chef relationship is that restaurants usually want small quantities delivered more often because they they really sort of um, they market on freshness and, and it's important for them to have top quality and very fresh products. So um, that delivery thing can create some stress on farmers. Um, chefs also have certain windows of availability which may not mesh perfectly with farming schedules, so you need to consider wh whether or not you're willing to accommodate those needs in those scheduling um, 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 needs of the restaurants because they have busy times, they have busy times, they have slow times, you have busy times, you have slow times. The two things may not always mesh. So it's not at all impossible to do. It's easy to negotiate, but it's something that you're going to want to think about. Um, how, you know, how flexible can you be in terms of your delivery schedules, your ordering schedules. Um, you know, likewise, chefs are also going to have preferences for certain cuts and farmers are going to have to have a plan for selling all the remaining things that, necess that don't necessarily get bought up. Um, that's starting to change a little bit, I think, Tom. I don't know what you're seeing out there, but it feels to me like I'm seeing more and more of those, um, those odd cuts that didn't used to sell turning up on restaurant menus these days. Right. Well, I, I think that's true. I think chefs are trying to um, lead a charge for a, a more sustainable um, way for all of us to live, and that that's going to require that we really start thinking about those odd cuts and and how to use them, and and also, you know, teaching people. Um, oh, you know, I see that in the store all the time, but I never buy it because I don't know how to cook it. And so, you know, you can use chefs to help you sell those things as well. One thing I'd like to say about being diversified enough, it's not just uh, whether, you know, the crops that you're growing, but the different 
kinds of businesses that you're that you're using. I personally think um, you know it's great to have everybody selling to restaurants, but I don't think um, I think you have to have a, a, a business plan that has has multiple markets. You know, yeah. CSA <laughs> as well as you know selling to restaurants or uh, your your own market stand and selling to restaurants or selling to co-ops or grocery stores. So um, I wouldn't put all my eggs in that basket either. So an appropriate I metaphor. About that when you're when you're planning, yeah, when you're when you're <laughs> planning your uh, you know your market your bu your business plan, you know, think about a variety of markets that you could go into. Super. So um, before we move on, does anybody have any questions? I'm not seeing anything in the chat box, but you're welcome to go ahead and type in something. We are a small enough group so we can afford to be um, a little bit flexible. So the next piece is sort of around personality. And I have worked for more than 20 years, um, both with chefs and with farmers. And I'll tell you what, they are um, they are very similar in many respects. And, um, and they're artists. They're both artists. And they are temperamental. And they work in a very high stress business. Um, and they both work on slim profit margins. And they both try to satisfy a very fickle public. So the more easygoing and conscientious you can be, um, the better the match is going to be. The last thing you need to do is to, be, to put two really sort of high strung people together trying to negotiate a business deal. I would agree with that, and I'd also say that you have to be, um, you know, you're right that chefs work on very slim margins as well as farmers, and and uh, sometimes, you know, you have as a um, when you're billing, you have to be really clear about what your, you know, what what is your net? When do you need when do you meet, when do you need payment? Is it upfront uh, on delivery, or can you wait two weeks, or can you wait 30 days? Um, those things are all very important to chefs because they're working on the same margins that you're that you're trying to work on too. So, which is another reason I think you have to diversify your market. You don't want to have, again, waiting for everything to come from one one place. Right. So the next um, one is: Are you geographically positioned to serve multiple areas? And this one I actually got directly um, from a couple of chefs actually in Maine that I was chatting with at one point. And they pointed out to me that, you know, that they, they like to buy from local growers, um, and, but their operations are generally pretty small and they succeed because they specialize in unique menu selections. And so, you know, if they buy something that's really interesting and unique from you, they don't necessarily want the restaurant across the street having the same thing on the menu on the same night. So. Um, the chefs are not going to want to buy from you if you're also selling the same product to all of their competitors, unless it's one of those very generic products that everybody is going to have, you know, like a salad mix or something. But in general, it's best to serve restaurants that are not direct competitors with one another. So you'll want to be in a location where you can de deliver to different markets without incurring unacceptable travel distances. And again, as Tom said earlier, um, you know, sort of diversifying your own market outlets so that you have a variety of different outlets is also um, a useful strategy. And the next consideration is can you offer extra value? And by extra value, I mean that sometimes getting a restaurant account will hinge on being able to offer something additional, something extra. And it might just be as simple as, um, you know, can you put together a sample box so that the uh, wait staff and servers uh, can try the product and know what it is that they're going to be selling? Um, or can it be, could you um, arrange for a personal visit to come in and talk to everybody about your business and tell your story because it's your farm story that's really going to help them sell a lot of what's going on. Um, are you willing to host a farm tour and have them come to your farm and learn a little bit more about what it's like? Um, I don't know, Tom, do you have anything extra to yeah, say on that? Or? 
I would absolutely agree. I mean, you know, the you have a story. The the chefs are actually selling the story in the restaurant. I mean, they've created a whole story, and uh, it's a a really um, multi-layered story because you know the plates are multi-layered and they have lots of there might be two or three or five or ten farms farms on one plate so you know your your story gets mixed in with everyone else I absolutely agree with that 100 percent I'm not I mean I like to see the samples but I know I'm going to see different things throughout the season so you know I, I do think when you have new stuff you should definitely bring it in and show the chefs what you have because they're gonna you know we're we like to buy new new things too, and um, and as far as the farm tours, I, you know, having the wait staff come out to your farm, for me working at New England Culinary Institute, I mean, we we are very interested in farms that are willing to have our students come out and spend the day with them and work it work it with them in the fields or spend some time talking to them about what they do, um, so that that becomes enormously important for us. Um, I you know the personal. The personal um, attention that you give to each of your accounts is incredibly important, um, and that's really, you know, I sometimes have people who come and see me five or ten or fifteen times before I buy something from them. You have to have some tenacity about this, and and um, you know, really have a chef who builds a vested interest in your success, and your and 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 you have to have the same sort of interest in their success. So yeah, it's really about relationship marketing in its purest form. Is um, and very often the staff that work in a restaurant um, are not necessarily familiar with how a farm operates or what's going on. Um, and you know, the, especially the servers, the wait staff, and the front of the house people are incredibly important in those consumer decisions. Um, they they weigh very heavily in amongst, um, especially the foodie consumers, because most of us when we go out to eat um, really quiz the staff a lot about what's on the menu, what's good, what are you recommend. Um, and the more that they think about your stuff, the more the story comes out, and the more the story comes out, the more compelling it is for the consumer to order something that they may not have ordered otherwise. And it really builds a relationship with those with those um, those customers too. They they definitely remember when they've had something amazing that came from your farm in a restaurant and they definitely will will seek it out. So the next one is um, a point of, of some discomfort for a lot of farmers that I've worked with over the years. And it's really, are you willing to be post your material? And it goes back to this idea that we were just talking about, about the um, having a story to tell. And um, a picture is really worth a thousand words. So many times, a chef farmer, I'm sorry, a chef farmer partnership is going to be augmented by the farmer providing some marketing materials. I mean, it could be a short history of the farm, again, that story. It could be photographs. Um, it could be, um, again, personal visits, you showing up for a particular dinner so that you know you can actually be there. Um, and all of those things can help the, the restaurant help educate the customers, which is really going to be the end goal. It works, it's, it's going to enhance your business in the long run. Um, but it is something that farmers are not typically all that comfortable with, is being out in front of the camera. So. Um, but that, that's one of those selling points. The more comfortable you are helping the, the, the chef create this image of this, this landscape that we're trying to promote, the, the more successful you will be and the more willing they'll be to work with you. Um, and then we'll go back to something we touched on just briefly earlier, which is you have the business skills to set accurate prices and negotiate a fair deal. And I really can't emphasize this uh, strongly enough. Restaurants like farms survive on very narrow profit margins. That means it's important that farmers know their cost of production to make sure that they're getting the right price for their product. Most restaurants are not going to be willing to provide a contract, so the farmer's going to have to have negotiated the best deal that you can for yourself. Um, Keeping in mind that really what we want is um, fair, fairness and equity, and that all starts with you being very clear about your business and knowing what your cost of production is. And Tom, do you want to add anything from the the restaurant side? Of the yeah, I think, uh, yeah, 
I think this is actually the hardest piece right here because, I mean, we, especially farmers who are starting out, we get calls from people who are just starting out and they're like, well, how much would you pay for this? And I'm like, well, how much is it costing you to, to you know, to raise it? I mean, that seems like a crazy way to try to, but that happens to, I mean, at the beginning of the season, that happens to us a lot. And um, I think that you have to really do your do your homework, see see what what um, the market will will bear. I also think that you by you know, the the added value or extra value that you add by you know coming in, doing the personal tours, all of that stuff is really important. And I think you have to you know when you find someone sort of um, vacillating, and you you need to remind them that you're doing things like. Um, um, Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, you you need to do things like um, um, let let the chef know how you how you're raising your 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 product. How how are you uh, benefiting the ecology? How are you uh, maintaining the integrity of your family farm? And all those things matter, and they are actually a part of the price that that chefs are going to pay, especially those who are really concerned about having a great partnership or um, you know. Slow food has the good, clean, and fair. And if there's a chef, chefs who are really interested in those things, they're going to be uh, interested in in the sort of intangibles and things that you might not think are important to talk about. Right. So, um, and and for those of you that are interested in pricing, we just we did a pricing uh, webinar last month, and there's some materials on the website for just that, and there are workshops. Um, that happen periodically that you will allow you to um, really figure out what your costs are and really drill down a little bit on what those prices need to be. Um, because again, you know, it's like you're, you're two separate business owners. Um, so on the one hand, you've got this relationship going on um, which is built on trust. And on the other hand, you're each business owners, you're going to have to cover those bottom line costs if you're going to stay in business. And so the chef is going to be negotiating from a position of what he needs for his operation or she needs for her operation, and you're going to be um, negotiating from a position of what you need to get. Um, and there, there is common ground in there. It just is going to take a little bit of time maybe to get there. So, okay, continuing on is, are you willing to make changes to your product line, production methods, packaging, et cetera, to accommodate a chef's needs? Um, again, most chefs want to provide unique dishes on their menus. They have a passion for preparing food. They're artists. Um, they may like the idea of buying local, but they may want to have some input into specifics. So, for example, they may prefer, um, you know, heirloom tomatoes for their salads rather than a more pedestrian variety. They may want some particular herbs that are a little harder to find and, and not necessarily part of what you would find on the, the regular supermarket shelf. Um, they may have special requirements for how they want um, the meat trimmed and cut and packaged. Um, and the degree to which farmers are willing to accept these requests and hear um, valid criticism and partner with local chefs who will determine the durability of the partnership. Uh, I, yeah, I would agree with that. Absolutely. I mean, it, and it's all sorts of things. It might be, you know, what's the, uh, you know, I want, I only want lettuce that's this two inches tall, not three inches. Um, I mean, it can be some really nit picky sorts of stuff and, and you need to be willing to either do it or not and I think that, that that's important. I also, you know, the the product that you bring into the into the restaurant um, at the back door needs to look great. I mean it needs to it needs to really reflect your values and, 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 and your understanding of what the chefs want. So, you know, I we have a we love finding new farmers. That sometimes we have to train them to actually, you know, rinse off the vegetables before, you know, because they're not thinking. Of, for, for some new farmers, they're not thinking about that. But for chefs, it's it's one more step that they have to actually pay somebody to take care of. And so, the better the the product looks when it walks through the door, the better off your, you know, the better your relationship's going to be. Mm -hmm. 
And it's actually, um, you know, even down to packaging. I mean, don't spend a lot of time bundling and packaging until you talk to the chef and ask them how they want it because it's just a waste of time and money for you to go ahead and package something if they're just going to turn around and unpackage it and um, combine it all together. So um, the more communication you do on that, the better. Um, and again, I just want to go back to that criticism thing because I do know there's been a couple of relationships that I've watched sort of dissolve over this is that um, you've got to have a fairly thick skin if you're going to do this. You've got to be willing to hear what people love about your product, but you've also got to be willing to hear about what wasn't quite right um, and what was disappointing when you delivered those berries and the last, the bottom inch was all sort of mushy because they got picked when they were wet. So um, you're going to have to be prepared to really sort of um, toughen your hide um, and hear, hear the truth and be willing to sort of work on that if you want these relationships to endure over time. So any questions on any of those? We sort of hurdled through those fairly quickly before we um, switch to our next, um, next steps. Um, and I, even though we're spending a lot of time talking about, um, you know, sort of things that seem um, like they're going to be a burden or they're going to be an extra work. Um, I just want to emphasize that I think that a lot of small scale farmers find restaurants to be a really unique and profitable market option and they end up um, having very, very valuable and rich relationships with folks and I think it's an excellent opportunity again to get your products out there. Um, let's, I see we have questions coming in now. Let's see. Uh, yeah, um, I, I'm really I had, Kate, the question you gave me about um, when's the best time to contact chefs. I actually think um, you know it depends on the what their business is. If they're purely a dinner business, you probably are going to be fine um, giving them a call. You know, uh, in late morning, that's when they're probably getting their deliveries. Some chefs are really fanatical and are there at six in the morning. Um, but I think if you can call them uh, a little bit later, that, that's fine. If it's an, a lunchtime business, definitely somebody's usually there by 8 o'clock in the morning, so you should be able to deliver or give them a call or send in your fax with um, you know what, whatever it is that you have um, available that week or that day. Um, chefs are pretty um, savvy now with computers. <laughs> um, so you know there's plenty of opportunities and for you to send here. information. Yeah. <laughs> yes, they're good with cell phones. So you know, I think that there's plenty of opportunity for you to contact them in different ways. And and uh, no chef is is uh, just like really no farmer is uh, can survive without a computer or a cell phone anymore. Um, you need it for your business practices. Um, so I hope that kind of helps you there. Um, Okay. Um, for does the restaurant's relationship with the primary food supplier flex with the restaurant's local food um, purchase volume? I think I think um, I think so, and I think you 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 know who their primary food supplier um, is. I think it really it sort of um, it changes for everybody. I mean, Neki has some some what we call a primary food supplier. You know, is providing all of our sort of staple products, but all of our vegetables and things like that we're trying to buy from local farms. And you know, um, for some local farmers, they don't want to deliver and they don't want to do that. So there's more and more opportunities to to um, use a you know a company, a food company, to be a distributor for you, and that seems to work out pretty well. But. Um, so um, just before we sort of leave this in terms of, you know, getting started, I think one of the things that I advise all the farmers I work with that are thinking about selling to restaurants is before you, before you pitch the chef, go in and, and have a meal there. Um, check out the menu. See what it is that they specialize in. See what it is that they're most proud of. See what kinds of customers they have. Um, see what kind of turnover. Um, see how many meals they serve. Um, you know, are they a breakfast and lunch place or lunch dinner place or dinner only? Um, it, all that information will really help you um, to be able to package the best um, pitch that you can when you actually go in there because you'll be speaking then from a position of knowledge. And um, most chefs, I would imagine, would be very flattered that you took the time to do your homework.
Yes, I would agree with that 100%. I also, you know, I think that there's, again, with computers, uh, there's plenty of information out there. You can read restaurant reviews. You can see what they're looking like. You can look at their current menus. You know, so if you walk in, you've got some idea of what what they're actually um, what they're doing, what they're providing, and even when you go in yourself, you can look at the quality of the product that's being served. I, I think that those are all. Um, great clues for you when you go in um, to sell your product. So, okay, I want to. Um, you can certainly continue to type in questions as you go, but I want to switch over now to talk just a bit about the Vermont Fresh Network, which is a terrific resource that we have here in this state. And um, I suspect that there may be similar um, organizations in other states. But Tom, do you want to give us a brief overview of the Vermont Fresh Network? Sure. Um, I, the Vermont Fresh, Fresh Network is um, purely a farm and chef partnership. It's, um, it was started originally 13 years ago, and um, I remember I remember when all those people came to talk to me about the Vermont Fresh Network, and I thought it was a great idea. New England Culinary Institute was one of the founding members with the state of Vermont uh, Ag Department and a number of other um, really concerned restaurateurs and farmers. Um, they all got together and decided that um, you know they wanted to create this partnership that was really based on a handshake. You know, it was a handshake deal, um, and it has really been sort of started in the Chittenden, Madison, Washington County areas, and it really has sort of um, taken over in the whole state. Um, and now we have uh, con consumer members as well. So we have um, concerned individuals who are really interested in where their food comes from. And most of them started their relationship with food by dining in a restaurant where a chef was um, featuring, um, proudly featuring the food from one of the farmer partners that they had. So in that respect, I think we've been um, really fortunate. And you know, I'm probably. I can't see any of you, but I imagine I'm probably older <laughs> than all of you. And uh, when I was when I was coming up, you know, you went to the grocery store. There was one kind of lettuce and maybe a couple of kinds of tomatoes, and um, it was all very seasonal. And um, as a result of um, dining trends in this country in the last 40 years, I mean, you can go into grocery stores and get hundreds and hundreds of items that just weren't available in the last 30 years ago. So. Um, and that all really started because chefs were demanding a certain products and, and and getting them and and so I, you know I think the partnership with chefs is one of the strongest that you can have for building your brand. Um, they are more than willing to help you build your brand, and they hope that in the long term you'll you'll continue to stay with them. But I'm finding even now in Vermont, it's been so successful the consumer part of of um, of your of your pro, your your market that um, you know I'm getting fired from some of the farmers that I use because they now have markets that are more um, you know more profitable for them. So I I think that that's all been very um, uh, good for the, the partnerships have been very good for farmers and for chefs. And so it's a membership organization. So Oops, sorry, sorry, everybody. I didn't mean to make you dizzy. <laughs> it, is, it is a membership organization. It's uh, you know based on fees that you pay on a on a um, uh, yearly basis. Uh, it provides you with um, all the information about um, what what we're doing as an organization, but also. Um, uh, you know, it introduces you to other chefs and farmers who are very concerned about the same things that you're concerned with. We're trying, as it's a, our mission is really to develop solutions for chefs and farmers to market more locally grown food, and have been very successful with that. We have new farmers and new chefs who join the organization and uh, really find a resource that's just not available to them outside of, of you know, um, canvassing chefs and and mostly chefs to find out you know who they're buying from, where they're getting their products from, uh, who's a good partner to work with, who's not. So you know the the fresh network has really been a, a great source of information for new new business owners and new farmers. Right. 
Um, and I see a question oh. about oops, about uh, the percentage. Do restaurants have to buy a certain percentage of their food to be part of the network? What we ask is that you have to, to really uh, try to use at least three um, different local producers f on your menu. And and some people fudge it. You know, some people it's, they buy three different cheeses from in the state. So um, we're trying to create a program now where consumers are actually um, helping us to uh, you know be more more honest and, and forthright about that and really going into the restaurants and asking um, people, you know the the chefs well who you know who is you know what on your menu is local and where is it from for all of us who are members I mean I think the primary thing is for us to actually have um, have these relationships with the farmers that's what the, the whole handshake and it originally was about so um, you know I think now we have a large number of our chef members who actually have 10 or more and some have 20 or 30 different people that they're working with which is a huge commitment of time for, for those chefs and, you know to to try to keep in touch and order th with 30 different farms is really um, it's really a commitment of time mm -hmm. so and, and, a, and obviously a labor of love so um, but as you can see from our membership, um, it's a little bit larger now. But um, you know, we have 178 chef chefs and chef owners who are members. You know, that's nothing. There's like 5,000 restaurants in the state of uh, Vermont. Wow. It's a uh, it's a very small number, and there and there's plenty more farmers than uh, who are actually members of ours. But um, everybody who is actually a mem who is a member ha has been very successful with this program, more probably more so than any other um, than other chefs, because we market together, we're building stories together. Um, people who are doing stories about the local food movement in Vermont go to Vermont Fresh Network first. So these chefs end up getting the I think the lion's share of, of press. Um, and they're introducing their farmers, and, and you know, so suddenly the farm, these farmers are the ones that get called when the New York Times wants to do a story on apples or maple syrup, or because um, it's a quick resource mm -hmm. for, for them. Great. So, Kate, to answer your question, um, this Vermont Fresh Network is a is a great resource um, for both chefs and for farmers, and um, I believe. Tom, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think they do have some meet and greet opportunities um, as part of their organization yes, yes, and, do. and do some matchmaking. So, Sure. Um, there's a couple of things. One, um, all of our members have a web, you can use our website to advertise the products that they have. And we're trying to work to create a system where you could, um, you know, order through our, our website from different farmers to get different products in your restaurants. Um, and then um, we do have, um, we also do, uh, I think last year we did four um, what we call, uh, um, you know, sort of dating services. There. <laughs> you know, um, what's the five minute date, dating thing, you know. So speed dating, so yeah. We, we did, we did uh, a number. Speed dating, yeah. We did, we did a number of those where you know we had a class or uh, some information that we could, um, you know, all all benefit from, and then um, we would fill out, um, you know, the farmers would send us information about what products that they would have or what value added products they had, and then we would, the, the chefs would pick the people that they like to talk to, in a in a one hour period, and they got to sit down with them and say, listen, this is what I have. Um, Chefs could ask questions that were relevant to them, or things that are, or were of interest to the chefs, um, and then they could build relationships from there. That started out as an ag program, and has been pretty successful. in the ag pro, um, department is, is has asked Vermont Fresh Network to take it over. Oh, good, great. Because I was just going to say, yes, I know that the Agency of Ag in the past has held some um, some of those events. So, and I think I don't. Do you know, Tom, what the, what the membership fee is? It does. It's not very much. No, I think uh, I, I believe the last time I checked, it was thirty-five 
dollars for farmers and I think fifty dollars for restaurants. So um, institutions like New England Culinary Institute are, are like a hundred bucks or something. So it's pretty reasonable for so the, really for, for the less than the price you pay for a newspaper, you could get a membership to this, which would get you access to sort of behind the curtain website, so you can see what people are are selling what what's going on. You can even if you're not there yet, you can still sort of be an observer and a participant. Right. Even as a uh, just uh, I mean it's a great resource. You know, you can really look at what other farmers are growing um, in your region, what's working for them. Um, you know, it's just a great resource tool. And certainly as a chef, it's definitely when I'm trying to create new menus or looking for new products to use, it's the first place that I go to look for those things. Great. So um, again, we've just got a couple of slides here on sort of why restaurants, and these came from the um, from from Vermont from Megan at Vermont Fresh Network. So some there's a little bit of overlap here, but. Um, again, it's really sort of about you know professionals highlighting your products. It's that branding which is good. It's a win-win. Um, and then again, it's the way from home mar dining market, and that's um, that, you know that's an area that continues to expand. More and more of us eat more and more of our meals away from home, so um, it just makes sense to find out who's cooking those foods and partner with them. You know, it's, and it's interesting. Um, uh, in the state of Vermont, people are really—I mean, people come to Vermont because um, the the state has done an incredible job of selling um, the, the Vermont Steel of quality. So people come to the state thinking already that they're going to get the best of the best, and then that's exactly what happens. They're getting great food, and they're going, "Gosh, I could—I never get anything like this, this fresh or this amazing in Boston or New York or." You know, um, Hartford or wherever they're coming from up here, and just as you saw with the Shelburne Farms, I mean, there's plenty of restaurants that are doing exactly that. They're listing all the products that they have and where they came from and where those places are located. And people are actually going and looking, you know, stopping by those farms and stopping at those um, farmers markets or cheesemakers and really um, getting to know the people who are producing their food. And I, for me, that's exactly what I want them to do. I, I want your farm to stay where it is, and I want it to be a picturesque and beautiful place, and I want people to stop there and say, "Oh wow, I was just at you know Main Street Grill, and I you know I had your you know I had your carrots or I had your your beef or whatever it is." So. So and of course, again, you know, it doesn't hurt to um, to have your name. Um, on the lips of a large number of consumers, and uh, restaurants again are are one way to do that. There's a lot of festivals, and um, I had an out-of-state friend of mine um, recently. I was chatting with her about something, and she said, "You Vermonters are really food obsessed, aren't you?" And I said, "I think we are, <laughs> but we're very happy." Well, you know, and it's funny. I, I uh, I've gone, I've gone. Um, I'm a slow food member as well. And I've gone to the Terra Madre in, in in Italy a couple of times, and it always, I'm always amazed. One that people from other countries are really aware of what's going on in Vermont, and I'm always amazed at how many people around our country are going. How do you guys do this? I mean, you can, you know, it's uh, Vermonters are eating more food bought locally per capita than anyone else in the country. And that's huge. It's not a it's not this gigantic number or anything, but it's but it's it's actually twice as much as the next um, leading state. So you know, we do take food very seriously. We are we are very, I think as a people in Vermont, very concerned about our in, environment and what we're looking at on a daily basis and and how we wanna how how we want to live, and I think that comes through in our commitment to the quality of food that we're that we're eating. Again, with slow food, I they're doing this thing right now called Time for Lunch, and it's about um, you know providing local food in in schools. And I I, I had to call them and say, well, you know, we're already doing that, and we're already doing that, and we're already doing that. So you know, I'm happy to send a letter to my my congressman, but you know. You might want to come and see what we're doing because we're already there, and and uh, you know for such a small state we're having a huge impact on on 
what other people are are doing. My chef friends from all over the country love coming here because there's just stuff going on here that they they're not seeing in other places. And the Vermont Fresh Network, for me, there are other organizations like organizations around the country, but they're not they're really they're not doing as good a job as the Vermont Fresh Network. Well, there you go. You've got you. You're in. You're all sitting in the perfect place to um, to get in on the ground floor of a, a really exciting food movement in this country. And um, Vermont has been a, a sort of a, a laboratory and has been light years ahead in production, in sustainable ag, in organic, in local food, in all kinds of these things. So it's kind of an exciting place to be right now. Um, just a couple of, of um, you know reminders about making your pitch to a restaurant, and this again comes from Megan Sheridan, who's the executive director for the Vermont Fresh Network. Um, is you know why are you growing what you are growing, um, and what you know what is what's the taste like? What's the difference? I mean, remember you're looking for unique. You're looking for something special because a tomato is a tomato is a tomato. So you're going to have to make your tomato be special. Um, again, that story I can't emphasize enough is you know the story behind your farm um, is so very important. It's what we why we all work so hard is because we want Vermont to have um, a diversity of small farms and we want them to be profitable and we want them to be um, to have a great quality of life. Um, and then quality is obviously an important consideration. And so, how what do you do to ensure your quality? What are you growing? Um, standards like how do you you know how is the, how is the chef going to know that the the stuff that you put in your sample box, which is of course your best stuff that you have available because you're trying to make a pitch, um, how is the stuff they buy going to measure up against that, and how are you going to ensure that week after week that quality is going to stay high? Um, and this is just a, another example of this sample box that we've alluded to a couple of times. And you know, really showing your best stuff. It's a chance to really sort of um, you know strut your skills and strut your wares, and um, and it looks beautiful, and um, it's gonna it's gonna impress the heck out of somebody. Yeah, they're always impressive, but the, the scary thing is that they're usually you're halfway through the season when you're really able to provide some of that stuff. Right. You need to again. I think the diversify, diversifying the your product. So you walk in the spring with really great looking stuff and say, you can't wait till you see what I'm growing the rest of the year, and um, you know, just just respond to that. And I've had, Tom, I'll let you comment on this, but I've had a couple of chefs over the years say, you know, it would be really nice if people would call me in like January or February when they're um, ordering and chat about some things. Absolutely. I think that's one of the one of the smartest things that you can do if you can if you can get in the door, which is really not that difficult. If you can get in the door and talk to chefs, then follow up the next year with them. Don't let them forget about you. Um, make sure that you call them and and early early in the process of choosing what you're going to grow for the following year and say, hey, listen, I'd like to sit down with you for 20 minutes and talk about what you think your needs are going to be for the next year and tell you what we're doing and. Um, you know, and that's a perfect time to tell them. You know, we're adding another few acres. We're, you know, we we got a, you know, we've got a new way of of uh, um, keeping weeds down that we want to talk to you about. You know, whatever it is. I mean, that's that's the time to really let them know. Um, you know, our berry, we planted our berry bushes three years ago, and now this year we're really expecting a, a great crop of, and this is what we have. I mean, those are all. Those are all perfect things to talk to them about in the off season and keep them thinking about what you're going to do. Um, I mean, we get chefs get sort of spring fever too. We're 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 going through the high mowing seed catalog. And Johnny, you know, we're we're looking through all that stuff too. So, you know, use that to your to your advantage when you're when you're trying to figure out what you're going to do for the next year. Have the chefs do the work for you. I mean, it's. Right, especially I think it's if you. Great way. Yeah. To, it's a great. It's a great way to maintain a relationship with them and get them excited about what you are doing as well. 
so um, and especially if you're willing to take a few risks, you know, if you've got um, a parcel of ground that isn't committed to something else, and, and you can go to them and say, hey, is there something that you'd really like to, to experiment with? Because I've got a little bit of space, and I'd be willing to trial some stuff for you. Um, and it's not going to cost you that much. It's not going to cost that, them that much. But it goes um, a long way towards cementing that relationship. Um, and then sort of those final details that nobody ever likes to talk about is, you know, sort of what's your delivery strategy going to be? Um, what's the invoicing? Tom mentioned that earlier. And it's really important that you be very clear about what your terms of payment are um, and, and whether you have any flex in that or not. Um, what kind of packaging you're going to use or not use, you know, how do you want things? Because again, there's no point in wasting anybody's time. Um, you know, you're all working on small margins, so um, be very clear about that. And, and communicating, keeping the lines of communication open. If you've promised something and, um, and you know, there's, there's a weather disaster, there's a flood, or there's uh, three weeks of rain like we had last year, um, you need to call those people as soon as possible and say, you know, I don't think I'm going to be able to fulfill that contract. Um, I don't think that this crop is going to come in. I'm having a lot of trouble with blight this year or something. You've got to be very clear about what's happening and keep them um, apprised of what's going on as it comes so that they can have a plan B in place. Yeah, that's that one's really important because I think uh, there's all kinds of um, things that can happen and and to your crops and and also for the chef. You know, the chef, you you. Don't be surprised if at some point in this process the chef calls you and says, my business just isn't where it was. And, you know, so having great lines of communication I think is very important on both sides. Um, I also think um, consistency is another thing that you have to think about. You know, your, your product has to be consistent and, and always look, um, you know, if you're, if you're selling your reputation on, on four-inch carrots, they need to be that they need to be consistent in in size, quality, color, um, taste. So those things are uh, very important as well. Mm, the tips, no surprises. <laughs> I think that's uh, true on both sides. I think I think the chefs need to be clear about how much they're going to actually use. I mean, and I would say with a new chef, a young chef who's just coming into their their restaurant or just coming into even Vermont, you know, there, the tendency is to be um, to overestimate what they what they need. And I think that's where people, you know, farmers, sometimes feel like they get burned by chefs because um, they're saying, oh, yeah, I want, you know, I'm going to want 36 heads of lettuce every two days for me, red leaf lettuce. And then, you know, Three weeks into it, they're like, oh, I can't use that much lettuce. And you've you've now planted <laughs> rows and rows. So again, that's where that uh, uh, you know uh, having a diversified uh, diversified markets is really important. So again, yeah, yep. you know, for me, do your homework. You know, doing your homework. Make sure you know. Chef, do a reference check on the chefs. You know there are other farmers who use them. Probably it wouldn't hurt for you to ask. You know, is this a good, good business partner for me? Is it somebody that I can really depend on? Um, are they really committed to to local local farming, or is it just um, is it just uh, you know marketing speak for them? You know they they want to they want to tell everybody that they're really into local, but they're not they're not as committed to it as as you might hope that they would be. And you should expect this, that the uh, the chefs might do the same thing on you. You know, if you're starting out or you've been doing it for a couple of years, they may ask other chefs who, you know, be prepared to provide them with references or or allow them to come out to see your place or whatever the case may be. Great. So we've got just a few minutes left here. There's a bunch of resources here, and these will all be available on the website afterwards. And of course, you can watch this recording. Um, any other final questions, comments, before we let Tom go back to work?
looks like everything's pretty quiet. I guess we covered the waterfront. So, Tom, thank you so much. So, I, uh, if I, I'm looking at this. Oh, you're very welcome. Oh, we've got one smiley face. It was my pleasure. I really appreciate it, talking to you about this. Well, topic. great. It was um, fun. I know how busy things have been for you, so I really appreciate your time. And to all of you that joined us tonight, I appreciate your time as well. And I hope um, you'll join us again next uh, next month. We're going to be doing uh, rotational grazing basics. That's going to be the topic with Rachel Gilker and Jen Colby from the Center for Sustainable Ag Pasture Program. And um, I have a link here for our, if you scroll up or I can maybe copy it for our evaluation tonight, we would greatly appreciate that if you, yeah, I guess I can't copy it so you can scroll up. But um, we would greatly appreciate you taking a few minutes to fill out that evaluation. And Tom, again, thank you so much. Good luck. We'll uh, look forward to uh, hearing an update on the Vermont Fresh Network another time. Uh, my, it was my pleasure. Thank you all very much. Okay. Good night, everybody. We'll see you next month. Good night.